This week on the Green Left News podcast, public housing under attack, huge auto worker strikes in the US, and TV and film writers win after 148 days on strike. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by refugee rights activist and Green Left journalist, Chloe DS. Welcome to the show. Hi, Isaac, and hi, everyone listening. It's good to be back. We're going to start off talking about the, uh, the housing situation in Victoria. Under the guise of solving the housing crisis, the Victorian state Labor government released a housing statement on September 20th which proposes the demolition of all 44 public housing towers uh, for public private developments and the sell-off of surplus public land to developers. And this was the last big announcement by former Premier Daniel Andrews before he resigned from Parliament. The statement claims 800,000 new homes will be built in the next 10 years. The statement also means that developments valued at more than $50 million dollars for Melbourne and for more than $15 million in regional Victoria can bypass local councils and go straight to the planning minister if they include 10% affordable housing. But the demolition of all 44 public housing towers across Melbourne by 2051 means more than 10,000 residents will be evicted and the replacement of towers will only include 11,000 social housing dwellings. The rest will be private. As we have discussed previously, social housing is an umbrella term used by governments to include both public and community housing. This has disguised the privatisation of public housing over the past 30 years by increasing the proportion of community housing relative to public housing. The government is attempting to funnel more vulnerable people into the capricious, predatory and irrational housing market. The demolition of these towers is going to make the housing crisis worse and ignores proposed alternatives such as renovating and upgrading existing buildings. Friends of Public Housing spokesperson Fiona Ross told Green Left that the destruction of public housing in Victoria will lead to more poverty, homelessness and an increasing underclass of people struggling to survive. Meanwhile, in New South Wales, the Labor state government released its first budget in September and housing activists have criticised it for failing to act on the housing shortages that are affecting hundreds of thousands of people across the state. Action for Public Housing said it delivers little for the 62,000 people who are experiencing homelessness, the 56,000 people on the public housing waiting list or people who are suffering from a shortage of 221,500 public homes. The budget allocated $300 million to state-owned developer Landcom to build just 4,697 new homes, and Waterloo South public housing tenant Karen Brown said that the money is only expected to deliver about 80 homes a year, which she calls completely pathetic. A New South Wales Community Housing Industry Association spokesperson said the budget is extremely disappointing, and Homelessness New South Wales acting CEO said it amounts to crumbs. In other areas, the budget included an essential services fund for teachers and health workers, investment in child protection workers and natural disaster response programs. And while governments do little to address the housing crisis in a substantial way, renters spent winter cold and isolated, according to the new report by Better Renting. The power struggle, uh, the power struggles Renting in winter study found that 70% of rental homes are too cold, tracking temperatures from 60 homes across the country from June 1st to August 15th. The majority were below 18 degrees Celsius most of the time, the World Health Organization guideline for minimum indoor temperatures. The ACT and Tasmania were the coldest states, while New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia were almost as bad. Queensland was the only state in which median temperatures did not fall below 18 degrees. 
Living in cold homes has been linked with various health problems, including high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, respiratory issues, and poor mental health. The report also cited the financial strain of high energy bills to keep homes warm. It concluded that renters' powerlessness in the fund- is the fundamental problem and that renters need needed more rights and control over the place they live. Yeah, as well as the desperate need for more public housing, renters' rights and rent controls, the fight for housing security also means the right to warm, well-built and well-insulated homes as well. And that's why the upcoming Housing Justice Summit on Sunday, October 8th is so important. It's taking place at the Maritime Union of Australia office in Gaddy or Sydney and also online via Zoom. And the summit's bringing together housing activists from across the country to discuss solutions to the crisis. Some of the key speakers include CFMEU National Secretary Zach Smith, Greens MP Max chandler Mather, Lilia Anderson from the Australian Institute, as well as public housing tenants and renters. And you can find more information about the housing summit in the podcast description or at greenleft.org.au. And now moving on from the housing crisis to the climate crisis, in Mianjin, Brisbane, more than 2,000 people joined a school strike for climate protest on September 15. The action was one of hundreds around the world over that weekend. Students and climate activists marched with the banner that said, our future can't wait and called for an end to fossil fuels. A National Day of Action has been called by School Strike for Climate on November 17th, so save that date and check the Green Left website for more details in the coming weeks. Yeah, there's some great photos of the Mianjin protest on the Green Left website as well. Um, But one of these gas projects that are being opposed by climate activists is the Middle Arm Development Project in the Northern Territory, which the NT government is trying to claim is sustainable and that the $1.5 billion dollars stake is not a subsidy for fossil fuels. But now a Senate inquiry has been set up to hold that claim up to scrutiny and will focus on the likely and intended future uses of Middle Arm. The Middle Arm project is opposed by traditional owners, with Mudbara, Jingili and Mangarari people sharing their concerns about fracking, climate change and water extraction in the NT at Parliament House on September 14th. Opposition to gas projects in the NT continued during NT Resources Week, which climate activists protested on September 13. Activists were pushed off stage and branded extremists for raising awareness about the need to stop fossil fuel projects. Activists organised a die-in outside the entrance to the convention centre to highlight the impact of the climate emergency. And in Nam, more than 100 people rallied at the Sea Life Melbourne Aquarium on September 15 against proposed gla- I'll start that again. In Nam, more than 100 people rallied at Sea Life Melbourne Aquarium on September 15 against proposed gas exploration and seismic blasting of the Otway Basin. The protest was called by the Southern Ocean and Protection Embassy Collective, which is a collective of Gunjitmara Ocean defenders and a haunting whale song was played on loop throughout the process uh, and a haunting whale song was played on loop throughout the protest creating an unsettling vibe the action follows recent anti-seismic blasting protests in western australia and there's growing awareness of the impact of seismic blasting on whales and other ocean life yeah it's pretty awful the, those blasts ruin whales hearing ability to hear and, um, yeah, they do need their hearing to be able to communicate and survive. Yeah, they say a, a deaf whale is a dead whale. So it's really important we stop these uh, seismic blasting activities from, from going on. The Voice to Parliament referendum is just around the corner and tens of thousands of people took part in nationwide walks for the Yes campaign over September 16 and 17. At least 50,000 people marched in Gaddy, about 5,000 gathered in Ngunnawal or Canberra, and 2,500 walked across the bridge between Ocean Grove and Barwon Heads in Geelang or Geelong as well, and there were thousands marching in Nam, Borlu or Perth, and Connor Yurta or Adelaide, as well as other towns and cities. Anti-war protesters marked the second anniversary of the AUKUS Pact at Sydney Town 
hall on September 15, chanting, No AUKUS, no war. This is what we're fighting for. Around 100 people attended the rally, which was organised by the Sydney Anti AUKUS Coalition. And on to some workers' rights campaigns, and the Transport Workers Union has said that Qantas Chair Richard Goida and the rest of the board should be sacked following the September 13 High Court decision to uphold two federal court rulings that Qantas had illegally sacked 1,700 workers in 2020. Former baggage handler Damien Pollard called the decision a fairy tale dream come true. The TWU is calling for Qantas to include a workers representative on the board and for the new CEO, Vanessa Hudson, to publicly apologise to the sacked workers. TWU National Secretary Michael Kane commended the workers' determination to hold Qantas to account and said the workers had not stopped fighting since they were illegally sacked. And on to other industrial action news. 1,000 workers at Ingham's Chicken in WA and South Australia took industrial action, demanding a 6% pay rise to address cost of living rises on September 22nd and 25th. The workers were supported by the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, or the AMWU, and the United Workers Union, or the UWU. AMWU Secretary Steve McCartney told Green left that Ingham's pays their mostly migrant workforce very low wages. Uh, on September 27th, it was announced that a deal had been struck, with workers getting a 5.12% pay increase in the first year and 4% increase in the two years after, as well as improved conditions and an audit of senior management behaviour. UWU National Secretary Tim Kennedy said workers would receive a well-deserved extra $100 a week. So congratulations to those workers. Yeah, huge effort and and well done. And meanwhile, uh, 14 members of the Electrical Trades Union who are employed by Enersys, Thomas Town, are now in the ninth week of their strike. The night before the electricians were going to implement work bans as part of their enterprise bargaining campaign, management sent out an email saying that they would be they would not be paid if they carried out the bans. And so workers voted unanimously at a July 26 meeting to walk off the job until Enesis revoked its threat. Human resources manager Linda Ratkovich shamelessly told the delegates in August, let's see who starves first. The workers want a wage rise matching inflation, better working conditions and a restructuring of wage classifications. ETU delegate David Martin told Green Left that Enesis often talks about work as being their best asset, but when it comes to the crunch, they don't give a shit about us. The workers are calling for solidarity from supporters by visiting the picket line or contributing to the strike fund, which you can find the details about at greenleft.org.au. Yeah, Green Left Radio interviewed David Martin a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, you can hop onto the 3CR website um, or Podbean and have a listen to that interview if you're interested in um, yeah more more on the NSE's uh, strike action. On to some community campaigns, and in Nam, a snap action drew about 30 people to Gowrie Station on September 19th to push for the duplication of the Upfield Line, which becomes a single track north of Faulkner. The action was called by the Upfield Transport Alliance, Sustainable Faulkner and Climate Action Marybeck as part of Transport Equity Week. The narrowing of the track causes frequent delays and cancellations as well as overcrowding and long wait times. Another transport issue in Nam that was highlighted during Transport Equity Week is the issue of accessible tram stops. More than 100 people protested on September 17 for accessible tram stops in the Marybeck area and they want this done before more level crossing removal works are done on the upfield train line. Sydney Road has just two accessible tram stops over a 5.5 kilometre stretch from Brunswick Road to the end of the tram line in North Coburg. Socialist Alliance Marybeck Councillor Sue Bolton told Greenleft that more unions need to join the campaign and that the Rail Tram and Bus Union had joined. And more than 150 residents in Geelang 
protested the proposed Prospect Hill Waste to Energy Incinerator Plan on September 16th with a march and speak out. Chance of EPA, do as you say, protest Lara all the way, ran, ran out through the streets. Uh, residents shared their concerns about poor air quality and environmental impacts on an open microphone. The waste incinerator is only 350 metres away from homes and 450 metres away from a gas storage facility. Residents promised to continue resisting the proposal. Refugees started a week-long protest for permanent visas on September 18th outside Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill's electorate office in Oakley, in Nam. Thousands of people are stuck on short-term bridging visas or have no visas at all. Arad Nick, who has gained permanent residency but is campaigning to win the same right for others, told Green Left that there are over 12,000 refugees who have been ignored or rejected in their applications for permanent visas. Yeah, and a lot of those refugees were, they had been waiting years and years for permanent residency and a lot of them came here by boat. So, you know, this policy of um, not granting uh, residency is just an extension of, um, well, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very racist policy to, they continue to attack people who uh, were so desperate they had to hop on a boat to escape um, their homelands. Uh, but meanwhile, there, you know, there was a good news story about uh, refugee Neil Para, who walked 1,000 kilometres from Ballarat to Sydney. He was granted a permanent visa along with his family, but refugee rights organisations say Labor needs to grant permanent visas to the thousands of refugees still waiting for a decision. Some have been waiting for more than 10 years. And we, we did interview Neil Parra um, while he was doing that walk a few weeks ago on Green Left Radio, so you can um, download the podcast and have a listen. Yeah, definitely have a listen to that interview. Um, shortly after Neil's walk, uh, 20 women refugees began a march from Nam to Nganawal on September 22 to demand permanent visas. The Refugee Women Action for Visa Equality March began outside Immigration Minister Andrew Giles' office in Thomastown. So you can follow that march on the Refugee Women Action for Visa Equality Facebook page. Yeah, we can the the refugee um, movement and a lot of these refugees. You can see the desperation. Um, they're organising these long sit-ins outside ministers' office, long walks. Um, it's pr- uh, very heartbreaking. Yeah, it's uh, such a, a terrible situation, but it's great to see that refugees are taking the fight into their own hands and um, doing whatever they can to to secure you know safety and, and permanent visas. That's right. And if you're listening and you want to get involved in building the refugee movement, because there's a lot of work to be done, um, just because the Labor government is in power and they promise to do all this, um, you know, they have promised to, to abolish temporary protection visas. There's there's so much work to be done in tearing down the entire detention regime. Um, please get involved. There's organisations like the Refugee Action Collective, which is an activist group, and yeah, it's a democratic grassroots group and it's um yeah we're constantly uh yeah fighting for refugee rights so i encourage listeners to get involved Green Left held a forum on September 19th titled Anti-Capitalist Wins in Latin America is the Pink Tide Back. It was chaired by Paula Sanchez from the Latin America Social Forum and Socialist Alliance heard from Joao Pedro de Paula from the Brazilian Socialism and Liberty Party or PSOL and the leader of the National Union of Students in Brazil. It also heard from Green Left journalist and former co-host of this podcast, Ben Radford, who is currently travelling across Latin America. Lucky. Um, hi, hi, Ben, if you're listening. 
Pedro said that pink tide tends to obscure the different struggles going on across the continent and that the original pink tide governments emerged after decades of military dictatorship. He compared the first Workers' Party government of Ignacio Lula da Silva in Brazil, which achieved important social gains with the current second Lula government, which represents class reconciliation and is restricted to limited change. And speaking from Cuba, Ben discussed the struggle in Colombia after the election of progressive president Gustavo Petro, who's being confronted by the far-right establishment, and the similar dynamics in Peru, where a campaign of destabilization started as soon as former teacher and peasant union leader Pedro Castillo was elected. And you can watch the full recording of this forum on the Green Left website. You can also listen to a forum featuring unionists and activists discussing the character of Anthony Albanese's labour that Green Left held on September 26th on the podcast feed. It features Zubul, Zane Alcon and myself speaking about how labour has undermined the working class throughout its history and the effect it has on movements for change today. Yeah, really worthwhile listening uh, through uh, that forum. It was, I really enjoyed it, particularly your talk as well, Chloe. So um, ch- definitely check that out. Um, Filipino community groups organised a commemoration on September 16 to mark resistance to martial law. And September 21 marked the official beginning of the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship in 1972. And Bong Bong Marcos Jr., who is his son, was sworn in as the 17th president in June last year. And he's already used anti-terror laws to attack activists, church groups, and indigenous communities. And speakers pointed out that these laws represent a new martial law and remembered the victims of torture, rape, killings, and countless other violations of human rights. Protesters took a stand against the dumping of Fukushima's nuclear waste into the Pacific Ocean on September 16. The action was organised by the Korean Community and Sydney Candlelight Action as part of a global day of action. Speakers condemned the Japanese government and called for international pressure to stop further dangerous radioactive contamination. And the anniversary of the murder of Kurdish-Iranian woman Gina Masa Amini by Iran's morality police was marked in Gadi on September 16 as part of an international day of action. At the Say Her Name Woman Life Freedom rally, speakers highlighted the courage of protesters defying their repression in Iran and called for unity in the democratic struggle. Protesters held placards calling for freedom for Iran and solidarity with Iran and held photos of Iranians killed by the regime. And now let's hear what is happening around the world. Major strikes against three big United States-owned car manufacturers are underway as members of the United Automobile Workers, or UAW, campaign for better wages and conditions in the radically changing industry. The strike began on September 15 and is historic as the UAW has never launched a strike against the big three manufacturers at the same time before. The big three are General Motors, Stellantis and Ford, and the UAW represents 150,000 workers, And President Sean Fain said that the strike was class warfare between the working class and the billionaire class. The strike takes place as major car makers invest billions in in developing electric vehicles. And it's significant that this strike action is taking place as the outcome of the negotiations will determine the balance of power between car workers and bosses for years to come. Rather than an all-out strike, the UAW is engaging in what it calls a stand-up strike where specific sites will be called out on strike with little warning to destabilise operations. On September 29th, Fain announced the strike was spreading to more plants, meaning an additional 7,000 workers would be on strike. And as the strikes entered their third week, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump both visited car factories in Michigan. Biden became the first sitting president to join a UAW picket line on September 26th, while Trump visited a non-union plant and blasted the union's leadership, declaring himself the only hope for auto workers. Many auto workers don't care for either leader, 
and some told the media that they wanted them both to stay away. The UAW has not endorsed Biden's re-election and said they would support candidates who show solidarity through actions, not words. And for the first time in 20 years, auto workers in Canada are negotiating collective agreements with the, th- with the big three automakers at the same time as US auto workers. Canadian auto workers ratified a three-year deal with Ford on September 24th and is now trying to reproduce that agreement with General Motors and Stellantis. The Ford deal covers 5,600 workers in Canada and includes a wage rise of 15% over three years, the highest ever negotiated with an automaker in Canada. The deal also means new workers will reach the highest pay grade in four years instead of eight. It also includes other conditions, including a cost of living allowance, paid holidays, and a better pension plan. And in a huge win for riders... The Writers Guild of America secured a tentative agreement with major Hollywood studios and streaming companies on September 24, ending its nearly five-month-long strike. The union was up against huge companies like Universal, Disney, Paramount, Netflix, Apple and Amazon, companies whose profits have been skyrocketing while riders' pay dropped. The tentative deal includes wage rises, increases to residuals, which is the money paid to riders for reuse of their material, and addresses demands for minimum staff in writers' rooms, bonus payments for successful streaming shows, and protections against the use of artificial intelligence. The writers' strike began on May 2 after a breakdown in talks between the union and the entertainment bosses, and virtually shut down production in big studios. The WGA strike was boosted by the SAG-AFTRA actors' strike in mid-July, and the deal will now be voted on by union members over the next week. WGA leadership said this contract, one with the power of member solidarity and our union siblings over a 148-day strike, incorporates meaningful gains and protections for riders in every segment of membership. It said the value of the deal was $233 million US, up from the initial offer of $86 million. The deal has had a flow-on effect uh, to the actors' strike as the entertainment companies realise they cannot outlast the striking workers, and as we're recording... Uh, negotiations have started between SAG-AFTRA and the big entertainment companies. So we'll report on this as things change going forward. Mm. And I know you mentioned um, this as part of the report, Isaac, but for listeners out there who uh, haven't been following the writers' strike, it was about writers um, demanding to ban the use of AI, artificial intelligence in script writing and to stop existing scripts being used to train AI. And just on that, I wanted to bring up that if you do live in Nam, in Melbourne, or you know, if you're willing to travel down for it, Green Left's hosting an annual comedy debate in November, November 10th. Um, so mark that in your, in your diaries. The, the comedy debate will have the title, We Should Welcome Our New AI Overlords. So it's going to be a fun night. It's going to be at the Fitzroy Town Hall. So come along. Yeah, definitely come along to the comedy debate. It's going to be heaps of fun. Um, In New Mexico, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham issued a public health order on September 8, which included an immediate 30-day ban on carrying firearms in Bernalillo County, which is the most populous in the state. And there's been a recent spate of gun violence, including the September 6th death of an 11-year-old. And other incidents include police shootings and the shooting of an unarmed Black Lives Matter protester by right-wing vigilantes. And in response to this public health order, there's been immediate objections and legal challenges coming from various sectors, citing the Second Amendment and the right to bear and keep arms. And Federal District Judge David Urias blocked the gun banning portion of the order on September 13, claiming that Grisham had exceeded her legal authority. Much of the outrage against Grisham is coming from Republicans and Trump supporters, and more than 150 angry gun-toting protesters rallied several times in Albuquerque's Old Town Plaza. There have been threats made against Grisham's life on social media, and violence and intimidation towards elected officials has become more common across the U.S. in the past few years. Meanwhile, in New York City, tens of thousands took to the street 
for the largest climate mobilization in the U.S. in years. Marchers called on Biden to stop approving new fossil fuel projects and accelerate the transition to renewable energy. They expressed outrage that Biden has refused to declare a national climate emergency and skip the UN Climate Ambition Summit on September 20th. More than 75,000 people attended the march, which comes at the end of a scorching summer characterized by extreme weather catastrophes across the world. The Cuban government has denounced the discovery of a human trafficking ring that sought to entice or trick Cubans into joining Russia's war on Ukraine. A statement from Cuba's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said, The Ministry of the Interior has detected and is working to neutralize and dismantle a human trafficking network that operates from Russia in order to incorporate Cuban citizens living there, and even some living in Cuba into the military forces that participate in military operations in Ukraine. Russian media has sought to downplay the incident while anti-Cuban forces in the US and Ukraine have claimed that Cuba is supporting Russia's war effort, seeking to tarnish the country's image. Meanwhile in Ukraine, there are fears that an incident could occur at Europe's largest nuclear plant. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been on the brink of disaster ever since Russian troops occupied it at the beginning of the invasion in February last year. Denis Bondar, who's a Ukrainian physicist specializing in atomic energy, explained to Green Left that since then, ZNPP workers have been subjected to physical and emotional harassment as well as forced labor, adding that the plant is understaffed. Concerns are growing that Russia may damage the plant intentionally should Ukrainian forces make progress on the Russian-occupied left bank of the Dnieprow River, particularly after Russia blew up the Kahovka Dam. There are major concerns of a second Chernobyl, and activists are campaigning for the UN to establish a demilitarized zone around the plant. And on September the 15th, five Papuan youths aged between 15 and 18 were shot dead at the mouth of the Brasa River in Dekai, the capital of Yahoo Kima Regency in the highlands of Indonesian-occupied West Papua. The police claimed the victims were caught in a firefight between security forces and the West Papua National Liberation Army, or the TPNPB, But the TPNPB confirmed on September 17 that the five victims were just civilians who wanted to return to their villages and were shot and bombed by the Indonesian military. The victims were members of the Kingmi Papua Church and their names were Danius Haluka, Musa Haluka, Man Senik, Yerman Senik and Kapai Payaj. Uh, and Australian West Papuan Association spokesperson Joe Collins said, there is a total lack of trust between the security forces and locals in West Papua. He said, while West Papuans are being killed by the security forces, we have Australia and Indonesia sitting down to discuss bolstering um, anti-terror cooperation. Collins said Australia should seriously look at the impact its ties with Indonesia have on West Papuans. And meanwhile, prominent West Papuan independent activist Victor Yaimo was released from prison in Indonesia's occupied capital of West Papua on September 23, sparking a massive celebration among thousands of Papuans. On his release, he gave a speech in front of thousands of Papuans who rallied to celebrate his release, saying, Racism is a disease, racism is a virus, racism is first propagated by people who feel superior. He went on to explain how racism has driven Indonesia to strip away the rights of other races and nations, including Papuans, and Yemo was unjustly convicted of treason because he was accused of being involved in a demonstration against a racist incident at a student dormitory in 2019. He was accused of being a mastermind behind riots that shook West Papua after that incident and was charged in February last year. His release brought a sense of relief for West Papuans 
and has reignited the flames of resistance against Indonesian occupation. This is great news and you can read his full speech as well as more about all of these stories we talked about today plus videos, detailed analysis and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. On October 7th, a National Day of Action has been called to stop black deaths in custody. The protests are calling for the implementation of the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And since the Royal Commission in 1991, more than 550 First Nations people have died in custody. The protests will take place in four cities, uh, Nam, Mianjin, Konyurta and Borlu at 1pm on October 7th. And you can head to blacksovereignmovement.com or B-L-A-K-S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T.com or go to greenleft.org.au for more information. And if you're living in Nam, Melbourne, there's going to be a refugee rally this Sunday, October 8th at 2 p.m. It starts at the State Library um, and the title of the rally is End the Cruelty, Permanent Visas for All Now. Um, you know, when people voted uh, the Anthony Albanese government in, they voted for change and the Labour Party did promise change, but it's continuing to drag out misery for thousands of refugees and asylum seekers um, and has refused to carry out its own election pledges. So, yeah, we need to be out on the streets again, um, refugees, asylum seekers and supporters to demand the cruelty stops and permanent protection for all now. So hope to see some of you there on Sunday. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. So go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is really appreciated. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. See you next time.